Hello, my name is Ruth Nyambura. I am a Kenyan eco-feminist based in Nairobi, and I am the coordinator of the Home Campaign. The Home Campaign brings together over 200 organizations across the world that reject uh, geoengineering and other false solutions to the climate crisis. So welcome to a very nice, final year conversation with uh, someone I really respect and I know many of you know who he is. His name is Nimo Basi. He's, um, I don't know how to describe it because there are too many things to describe today. I'm only going to describe Nimo Basi, the poet. Um, I'll let him introduce himself uh, with the other things, but today it's, I'm having a conversation with Nimo Basi, the poet. Nimo Basi, um, the person, the activist who continues to give us a lot of hope in our resistance and, you know, hope to dream of uh, a better world. Nimo, welcome. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I think I'm very happy with that introduction. I don't need to elaborate on that. Uh, only to mention that in Health of Mother Foundation, where, uh, which I direct, we spend time looking at the root causes of the environmental misbehavior, political misbehavior we're seeing, not just in Nigeria, but across Africa and in the world at large. Thank you so much, Nemo. Nemo, I'm just going to start by asking you, um, how has this year been when you, when you want to take stock of this year? It's a year that has been dystopian in many, many respects. Um, we started off the year you know, hearing about a virus that was so far away and then became so close um, to us. It's fundamentally changed how we think about the world, how we are in the world, uh, but it's also a virus that has surfaced already existing inequalities, you know, inequalities that, you know, people like you as an activist, but also movements across the world have been exposing for years saying that this is a fundamentally an eco world. The economic system fundamentally works for those who are wealthy for the 1% and it doesn't work for all of us. So this virus in many ways, in as much as it has shifted how we look at the world, but it has exposed you know, what so many activists like you have been saying for for the last many, many decades. So how's it been for you this year? It's been a very dramatic year, but we've learned never to be taken by surprise by things happening around us, because a whole lot of the things happening in the world are contrived by humans, uh, by human activities, by systems that humans have built, by corporations who have life as uh, persons when it's convenient and not when it means taking responsibility for actions. Uh, but on the whole, the, as you really mentioned, it's been a very surreal year. Uh, <laughs> like every other year, it starts with a lot of hope. And, and right now, through the COVID-19 pandemic and the dramatic responses by governments, it's been like a script, like a fictional script being run by the invisible hands around the world, uh, invisible, which are quite invisible anyway. Uh, we, we saw, uh, what, what I've seen really, my, my conclusion in the early days of the pandemic uh, was that nothing is going to change except we take action to make that change happen. Uh, the virus itself may provide the background for mobilization, but it's not going to change anything by itself. Uh, we've seen people adjusting uh, people suffering. Uh, the system has punished the poor. Uh, system has uh, further deepened inequalities, as you said. Uh, people who don't have space to lay their heads down to sleep are asked to observe physical distancing, uh, which is almost impossible. And then social distancing is an insult, really, because it's very colonial. Uh, you you ask to keep away or look away from your masters or from people because of social differences. Uh, I, I'm happy that many people prefer to speak about physical distancing when that is possible. Uh, but on the whole, as so I've seen that this year has really exposed the underbelly of capitalism uh, because we see a lot of speculation. The COVID-19 pandemic has been, has been a canvas for speculators to, to really, really rip off the world. Uh, in other ways, we I mean, compare people use the military to lock down people. In Nigeria, in the first few weeks of the pandemic lockdown, more people died from uh, security confrontations than from the COVID-19 itself. Uh, 
uh, itself. So that, that that was very revealing. And then we, we we saw right from even before the pandemic came that there were speculators even in the area of the vaccines that if this happens, we're going to have to invest uh, in development of the antidotes. And as we've seen, you, if you're going to vaccinate the entire population of the world, that is big business. That is really big business. Now, without having to question the vaccine itself or whatever uh, <laughs> related to it, but it's just good to see that business aspect that we saw the international financial institutions quickly shuffling around and telling African countries and global South countries that look, we could delay your repayment of the debt. They're not canceling the debt. We could delay, uh, reschedule your debt and then allow you to use that gap as a help to fight the pandemic. So the pandemic has really, really uh, given impetus to the oppressors and the exploiters to deepen their grip on the system and to further impoverish and inconvenience a lot of people around the world. No wonder there's also a lot of suspicions going on. Uh, and so the, the, I think one of the things we have to do this year, really, uh, one of the things we've been trying to do this year and which we have to do going forward is to critically re-examine the stories that we tell. Uh, rebuild the narratives and, and point the direction of our imaginaries. Otherwise, uh, one could say that this year is ending on a on, on a way in, in a way that uh, still remains challenging and unclear. But as you said, we have to keep hope alive, and that hope must not be something just to make us feel good. It's got to be hope in mobilization, hope in the struggle, and hope through organizing. Thank you so much, Nemo. Um, I mean, um, one of the things, as you said, that um, was very surprising to see. I mean, the, of course, there's always been a there's a very big uh, global movement to cancel debts, especially debts from the global south. I mean, it's very interesting to see how the IMF and the World Bank, as you said, they're not canceling the debt. They're saying that we can rethink the repayment, um, you know, the repayment uh, methods. But at the same time, not just rethinking of the repayment methods, we do know that very many countries have borrowed more money in this particular period because of the crisis. But what is interesting is that we see that because of the debt issue across the continent of Africa and across countries in the global south, is that, you know, the restructuring from the 1970s and the 80s, you know, um, made sure that the public health sector, for example, has collapsed. So you're having a pandemic, you know, in countries whose public health sectors literally have collapsed structurally. You know, people like to call it corruption from particular uh, governments, but it's larger than that. It's a systemic and structural collapse based on, you know, uh, the economic policies of the financial policies that have been pushed you know, um, across uh, the global south in the last 30, 40 years. But I also want to go back to something that you said in terms of uh, one thing about um, this year and the continued uh, repression. Uh, I know that um, you've also done a lot of work around, you know, handling the bills that are being pushed in terms of GMOs, for example, in, um, you know, in Nigeria. But we're seeing that even within the crisis that we find ourselves in, you know, market oriented uh, environmental so called solutions are still being actively pushed, which is very interesting to, to see, you know, you'd think that within the, in the midst of a pandemic that we'd have less of, you know, sort of like this journey to a death mill that we've always found ourselves in, but um, there are more and more policies, you know, around techno fixes, you know, around market schemes that are being pushed around the you know, environmental policies and you know, to solve the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in. And then what is your response to that in the sense that um, we still find ourselves matching to, to our certain, almost a certain death? Um, it's really very, in a sense, surprising that the system is so resilient in terms of keeping on the wrong track uh, but you know, over over the years, people have got to be, come to believe that technology can fix any kind of problem. Uh, that whatever is broken can be fixed, and whatever needs to be broken must be broken. Uh, and and on, upon all this, we've seen that the basic underlying uh, push is for control. It's about the power, about who 
who, who sets who sets the pace and who dis, who benefits from what is going on. Uh, and so it's not really very surprising that those speculators who are selling and developing and selling these technologies, these techno fixes, are also investing a lot in having foot soldiers in our nations who promote who promote these false solutions. Um, Nigeria is a very bad example for Africans, I must say, in terms of bio, modern agriculture, about technology. Uh, while, uh, in, and, and there's things that we just look at. The, in 2016, when the first uh, permits were given, they were for genetically modified cotton, cotton that is modified to act as a pesticide, BT cotton. Uh, it was the same variety that just failed and was abandoned in Burkina Faso that was being approved across the border in Nigeria. So it shows uh, quite interesting, shows how impervious and uh, to, to reality and to the needs of, of farm, poor farmers who, who, who were caught in the trap of cultivating that cotton variety that ended up, ended up impoverishing them in Burkina Faso just across the Nigerian border. And this was, uh, it was really dramatic that that happened. Of course, we opposed the application, we sent objections, but the, 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 the management agency just ignored everything, ignored all the opposition uh, uh, and approved, approved those uh, varieties. And, and just last in 2019, when we thought that we had it bad enough, the agency went to the National Assembly in Nigeria and got the law that set up the agency, the Nigeria National, National Biosafety Management Agencies Act 2015, got it reviewed to now include a page that defines gene drives, synthetic biology, and all the extreme, extreme techniques that have come into the, the system. Uh, and so, and normally when, you, when we see a law of that nature, we are told that it's meant to protect us. But we know that the law actually is to allow permitting, to allow the permission uh, or the permitting of these uh, extreme technologies into the system. Uh, and, and that goes beyond just beyond just uh, exposing uh, a, a system, ecological system to danger. It also exposes everyone to uh, very challenging biosecurity considerations. Uh, because we have a situation where, um, like the genetic engineered mosquitoes that were that still be experimented on in Burkina Faso again, uh, they are preparing to introduce uh, gene drive mosquitoes that would exterminate. Hopefully, I mean they, they plan, they think might, might exterminate the Anopheles species uh, and, and thereby wipe out malaria. Uh, now, wiping out malaria is sounds good everybody nobody wants malaria right now we have a lot of people dying from malaria than than from covid 19 in africa uh but then the the sensible safe uh ways of tackling malaria which is not being looked into but rather looking into techno fixes that would open it's like putting a foot or a shoulder in the door uh once we say this is okay we can go that way then the floodgate will open and africa becomes a big field for experimentation of risky technologies, not just in terms of biotechnology, but maybe also in geoengineering that leading to more graphs around us. You know, one of the things that, um, that emerges when I listen to you is that apart from um, how countries or continents are being turned into open fields of experimentation, um, we also see the fact that this is literally, it's going to benefit particular companies, right? It's still things that are considered solutions, but it's really um, something that in which very particular um, uh, transnational corporations are going to benefit from. And that's one of the things that we keep saying at home campaign against when we work against geoengineering, we keep saying that you have to look at the, also the financial and economic underpinnings and ideologies that are guiding this uh, guiding this so-called solutions because solutions that actually work 
to fight against the climate crisis, solutions that actually make sense in terms of the public health sector, for example, as you said, there are very meaningful ways of dealing with uh, malaria. One thing, for example, would be the fact that you have destroyed the public health system, but also the, you know, the ecology itself has been yeah. Um, destroyed, right? So that just, just going back, zooming into into that aspect of the fact that you know the same companies that bring us the crisis, the multiple and intersecting crisis we find ourselves in, are still the companies that are benefiting from the solutions that are being pushed. While the space for civil society and organizations is growing smaller and smaller and smaller. And every single year we see the fact that uh, environmental uh, rights defenders are getting murdered in such high numbers. Uh, and it's become a very risky thing um, to be engaged in. You know, the fight for rights, the fight for justice. Uh, absolutely. Um, we're seeing a situation where, as you rightly said, um, or as you implied, uh, capital has become the god of this world. And anything on the altar of capital is permissible uh, by the high priests who are the transnational corporations and the politicians who are performing the roles of the warrant chiefs uh, of the colonial days, as well as slave drivers. Uh, and this is, this is most unfortunate, uh, but it's something that we really have to keep on. That's why I mentioned at the beginning that our storytelling uh, must really continually unveil the roots of these challenges uh, because people are, people are benefiting from misery. They're, they're trading, trading on our blood and sweat. And uh, the, the, solu the so-called solutions in almost every dimension is just meant to intensify exploitation. Uh, as you said, uh, the health systems have been deliberately, deliberately sabotaged through structural adjustment programs of the IMF and the World Bank over the over the past uh, decades, uh, and so and we are told that something like COVID nineteen happens due to underlying causes. And this underlying, say underlying health health uh, causes, but. It's more than that. It's also on the underlying economic factors, underlying political factors, underlying social factors. This is what the virus latches on. And so the virus is not just the invisible thing. It's also the politician. It's also the transnational corporation. They are the ones who are propagating uh, the, the many challenges that we have in the world today. Uh, and you know, again, going back to extreme genetic engineering, when you look at climate change negotiations, uh, and I think at the Madrid Madrid conference uh, of 2019, uh, it was very clear that the hands of the polluting industry was very, very, uh, very, very alive in the drawing up of the playbook of the of the Paris Agreement of the implementation processes, uh, because they 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 very craftily. Uh, introduce and politicians keep aping, I mean, I keep announcing this, that, you know, technology is a critical part of the solution. And they won't say what technology did I talk about. Uh, as if te technology, you know, they keep repeating this so that it gets into the brains of everyone, even, even the uh, unsuspecting, some uns unsuspecting uh, campaigners, and that this is, look, you cannot overlook this, but Look, let's put it on the table. What is this? It's the same way that market environmentalism was introduced to climate negotiations, starting from uh, maybe even before Kyoto in 1997 or thereabout. Uh, we had cases where people say you cannot, people, nobody could take climate action except they see the financial implications or benefits of that action. Nobody's going to protect nature except nature has a price, except you can put monetary value on nature. And people just say, yes, it's true. We cannot, how do you expect me to protect nature? How do you expect me to take action to, to preserve my environment if I'm not good, if I cannot see how much that translates to in my bank account? It just shows the the madness, the the fact that we've lost our minds, we've lost our sense, we've lost a sense of humanity, we lost a sense that we are part of nature, and we're thinking that we are masters of everything around us. I believe this is what uh, the kind of 
thing that we need to really challenge very deeply um, that how could somebody say we're going to uh, capture carbon from the atmosphere and we're not talking about the release of carbon from where nature has kept the carbon. For example, why shouldn't keeping fossils in the ground be a cardinal climate action? What well, we know that it's extracting these fossil fuels and burning them that is driving the crisis that we're seeing in terms of climate change. Uh, but you know, everybody just, well, we know got the carbon, we have to burn it. We, there's a lot of money attached to it. Africans as so African governments, the uh, politicians declare that if anybody tells Africa not to extract crude oil and burn it, that they are maybe probably they, those such people can be said to be unpatriotic and and, and and talking nonsense. So we have to burn it. We have a right to development, we have a, a right to progress, but we have to define what is development. We have to define what is progress. If progress means alienation from nature, I think that doesn't make sense. Uh, and now if an engineer saying, well, you know, we can take carbon out of the atmosphere by using more trees. Of course, we want more trees. I love trees. We all love trees. We like to sit under greenery. We like to have fresh air. But the idea is not this idea is not just about trees. It's about genetically engineering trees to have enhanced capacity for photosynthesis. It's like saying nature is inefficient. So when somebody says nature is inefficient, my first reaction is that you are, the person's brain is inefficient. Because if your brain is connected from nature, you are, actually need to see a doctor. And the best doctor may be a native doctor, as we call them, the Sangomas, who would help to get you back into shape. I like that. Um, yeah, I like I like the idea of visiting a, a Sangoma. So Nemo, uh, uh, just in conclusion, um, what is your what is your vision? What is your message for hope as we? You know, this year is almost over. Uh, we the, this long train we've been in is almost at the train station. Um, you know, what is what is what is your vision? What is your vision for next year? How should we mobilize? What kinds of things should we look forward to? How can we grow our power? Ruth, you ask the most difficult questions. This is what everybody wants to avoid at this time. <laughs> So that we like we go blindfolded into the new year, then we remove the blindfold and say, "Wow, this is 2021." <laughs> but but really, one thing I've learned, um, one, one thing, one thing I've learned through this crisis in 2020 is the fact that um, we really activists need to propagate means of campaigning without being visible. Uh, I mean, we are grassroots activists. The grassroots have to take the lead. We have to really work to make the grassroots lead. Then we follow either in the middle or at the rear. Uh, it became clear to me when we couldn't go to communities for meetings because of the lockdown that we couldn't just say, okay, communities, you, you fend for yourself. We have to stay far away, but we had to find a way to communicate, find a way to share ideas, and really see things happen. And I saw a lot of changes. I saw more groups, communities coming together and really, really pushing uh, their positions for their demand for change. And I think this is something we have to take going forward into next year, the invisibilization of activism, or of activism, not activism, because we've been too much in the front. We have to become more invisible and really get things going. Uh, the other thing I believe we have to do, uh, which I think the home campaign is doing very well, is to pick up these complex issues and break them down to simple language. When those who are the exploiters speak about the changes and the actions that things should take place, they make it sound so esoteric, uh, so, so, so high level that these are things that you can only do when you wear gloves and wear white gowns and you're in a laboratory. But these are things that, that are just very sensible things that we need to, to know and to take action on. And so we need to break these stories down. We have to tell the stories in our own languages. We have to bring back the moonlight tale, so to speak, and sit down in circles and share our experiences, share our dreams, recover our memory. I've been thinking about it. We need to recover our memory. We have to, we've lost our minds. We need to recover our minds. Go back to look at the concepts that really build, uh, uh, build communities in Africa, in the global south, in the global north, because we have every, in every region of the world, you have authentic systems that actually build harmony and solidarity. 
everywhere in the world. So we need to bring these trends together uh, and begin the, a new uh, a system, not really new, of recovering, uh, discovering where the rent started beating us. That's what Kino Akeba said uh, in one of his books. Where did the rent start beating us? We need to. Where did this happen? Where where was? Where did we take the turn in the, on the wrong road? And of course, understanding the fact that no matter how far you've gone on the wrong road, you're not going to get to the right destination. And so this this should really help us to retrace our steps. And I think this is what we have to do next year: pick everything, in years and going forward, every single thing that we've been told is the way to go. Let's question them. Let's question them and let's look at the alternatives. And and of course, we should not be browbeaten when we say there's no alternative. There are many alternatives. Say no is an alternative in itself, uh, to quote Subcommandant Marcos of the Zapatistas. So, so if I'm able to say no to a thing, I should be confident to skip saying no because that is a real alternative to the nonsense that people are saying yes to. Thank you so much, Nemo. You know, I'm not even going to say anymore. I'm just going to pick up from what she said from, um, you know, the Zapatistas. One of the most famous quotes is that you make, we make the road by walking. You know, that's the only way we do it. So I will take what you've said and, and, you know, coming into the new year is that we only make this radical new possibilities and walls when we do. The praxis um, um, is, is ultimately the most important thing. That's how you figure out uh, what your, you know, freedom dreams and ideas are. Thank you so much, Nemo. Um, it's very interesting how uh, the names of the two organizations are. Yes. <laughs> I'm so enjoying. So hands off Mother Earth <laughs> and, you know, Health of Mother Earth Foundation. And I love that. I love how this to home, you know, and home is a beautiful place when you think about the idea of home. It is a foundation. It is a grounding. It is where we become, you know, selves and people. So thank you so much, Nemo. Um, for not just this conversation, but for the radical work that you are doing, together with so many activists on the continent of Africa. And um, we hope that everyone who has listened was going to watch this or listen to this is going to be filled not just with dread because that is not, the purpose is not to fill people with dread but the purpose is to radically think about how we can transform the world because nobody can transform the world for us. We transform the world uh, for ourselves. Thank you so much, Nemo, and um, have a happy holiday and um, in solidarity as you always tell us. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Ruth. It's so good to know that home is also in your hands. That's one of those who are holding home. So keep on working and best regards for the new year. <laughs>